Thank you, Bruce, for that uh, excessively kind introduction. Um, uh, can I say, Dean, that it's a, a great pleasure to be in Dalhousie in the bicentennial year of the university's foundation. Um, and I guess, too, from your point of view, but uh, less so from my point of view, uh, it's good that my visit has been associated with the uh, definitive end to your long, dry summer. <laughs> uh, um, it's a real pleasure to give uh, this uh, Christi, Innes Christie lecture. I have on my shelves two books in which uh, Innes's name appears. Um, the first is the book entitled The Liability of Strikers in the Law of taught, and which is uh, subtitled A Comparative Study of the Law of England and Canada. Uh, this was published in 1967 as I think the fifth publication in a series, in the research series of books put out by the Queen's University uh, Industrial Relations Centre uh, in Kingston, Ontario. A really remarkable collection of publications which achieved uh, international uh, recognition. Uh, and this is work in that book was based on work that he'd done in the University of Cambridge, that's Cambridge, England, uh, under the supervision of Bill, uh, later Lord uh, Wedderburn. Uh, the second, uh, I didn't meet uh, uh, Innes at that time. I met him uh, at another academic institution a bit later, and that gave rise to the second book in which uh, Innes's name appears, which is on my shelves, which is the Yale Law Reporter of uh, 1969. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Innes and I were both uh, graduate students at Yale. Um, Innes was already as the publication shows, established in an academic career. Uh, I was uh, younger, uh, living abroad for a significant period of time for the first uh, time in my life. And uh, Innes was extremely kind and supportive of me. I remember that very well, except that his kindness stopped at the door to the squash court. <laughs> Um, um, Innes came back to Dalhousie and devoted uh, his scholarly time to uh, employment law, labor law. Uh, I did a lot of that uh, for the first two thirds of my career, but have now drifted into uh, corporate law. Um, one justification I might put forward in my defense is that our joint mentor, Bill Wedderburn. Um, Bill was uh, Innes's mentor in Cambridge, my mentor later on at the LSE. Uh, pursued both subjects, labor law and uh, company law. Uh, and my lecture could be seen as an attempt to explore this evening the uh, interrelationships be between the, the, the two subjects, which is why I'm going to try and inflict upon you this particular topic, even though I'm giving, I believe, the Innes Christie Lecture in Labor Law. Okay, so um, what my uh, lecture is about is, uh, so to speak, a ship that over the years has sailed under a number of flags of convenience. Uh, when I first came into uh, uh, corporate law, or, uh, it was called stakeholderism. Uh, later it became corporate social responsibility or CSR. And the latest name on the flag is ESG, Environmental, Social and Governmental Objectives. Um, now these terms are not identical, but they do have at least one underlying common theme which is that there should be a move away from shareholder-centric uh, corporate law. Uh, and that's the theme I'd like to explore with you uh, this afternoon. 
Um, now, th my lecture has uh, three parts. Um, in the first place, uh, the first part, I want to argue that traditional corporate law <laughs> does in fact pursue a conception of social welfare even in the absence of any express reference to social objectives. Uh, and this, of course, is an idea which is already well established in the law and economics uh, literature. So what I want to do is go on and argue that this social welfare objective is attainable only if certain conditions are in place. And if those conditions are not in place, then it will be necessary for corporate law uh, to adopt certain social values in addition to its core social welfare objective. And in the second part of the lecture, I want to try and show how this argument works out in relation to employees contracting with a corporation and in the third part of the lecture, how it might work out in relation to uh, corporate harms that companies may inflict on the environment. So uh, my overall conclusion is uh, going to be that um, uh, a remodeled uh, corporate law has more potential for dealing with employees contracting uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis the corporation uh, than in relation to the prevention of environmental harms by companies where it seems to be external regulation, that is to say regulation external to corporate law, has a much bigger role to play. So, starting point is that um, traditional unreformed uh, corporate law does in fact pursue a social welfare objective and is not there simply to promote the welfare of shareholders as a, a group. Um, so that is a quotation uh, from a book on uh, corporate law which appeared in 2004, i.e. before the latest CSR ESG debate really got going. Uh, it's a very short book. Uh, nevertheless, it has seven authors, of which, as Bruce has indicated, I was one. And uh, the reason I put it up there is to show that at the beginning of the century, a group of corporate law scholars from different jurisdictions writing a book on comparative corporate law thought it entirely unproblematic to assert that the purpose of corporate law was to promote the welfare of society as a whole. So the immediate question which arises, of course, is how can that proposition be squared with a further proposition uh, which the authors of this book also make, which is that corporate law across jurisdictions assigns ultimate control of companies to shareholders and not to any of the other providers of the inputs which are necessary for the business of the company to uh, flourish. And as you can see from this further quote, uh, the book seeks to, def seeks to square this circle by asserting that the promotion of the our giving shareholders ultimate control of the company is not done for the benefit of the shareholders as such, but because it's the best means of promoting the welfare of society. So the first thing is to understand how this perhaps counterintuitive argument uh, actually works. So the first thing to notice perhaps is that Control rights over companies are not normally allocated to all shareholders. They're only allocated to a certain class of shareholders, namely those shareholders who have no contractual rights against the company to a return on their investments. 
So control rights are normally allocated to what in the UK we call ordinary shareholders. I think the US refers to them as common shareholders. Uh, whereas those who do have, those shareholders who do have a contractual claim against the company for a return, preference shareholders, are not normally given uh, voting rights. Um, so <coughs> shareholders uh, without voting rights will be dependent for a return on their investment on how, sorry, shareholders without contractual rights will be dependent for a return on their investment on how well the management runs the company and what the decisions the board makes about the distribution of profits. Without governance rights, shareholders would be exposed to the opportunism of management and the board in those respects. So, and this would mean that the supply of risk capital uh, to the company would likely be less. Why should I hand over to the company a chunk of money without either contractual or voting stroke governance protections for my, for my expectations of a return? So one argument you could make for ultimate shareholder control of companies is to facilitate the supply of risk capital to companies. But actually, the social welfare argument goes more deeply than this. Um, the point is not simply that ordinary shareholders do not have contractual rights to a return on their investment. It's that other providers of inputs to the company, debt finance, labor, raw materials, do have a contractual entitlement to a return, to a payment. Moreover, these contractual entitlements of the providers of the other inputs need to be satisfied before anything is distributed to the shareholders. So ordinary shareholders sitting at the end of the queue, being as it's usually said, residual claimants on the company's revenues have the maximum incentive to increase those revenues and hence to improve the operational efficiency of the company. This promotes social welfare because it tends towards the production of goods and services at least cost to the benefit of those who consume them. So the standard argument for shareholder-centric corporate law is essentially an efficiency argument. It's an, um, an argument which says that shareholder-centric corporate law tends towards the least use of resources in the production of the goods and services which society consumes. Okay, so that's the argument. What's the relevance of this argument for my topic this evening? Well, it certainly makes it more uh, challenging. Because if company law was simply a set of rules designed to promote the, uh, designed to maximize the welfare of shareholders, then wrenching those rules around so as to add the pursuit of social objectives to the core social welfare objective would be, from society's point of view, an absolutely straightforward policy decision. Because right? all the costs would inure to society, sorry, all the benefits would inure to society, and all the costs would fall on the shareholder. But given my starting point, that unreformed traditional company law uh, does pursue a socially valuable objective, then there is a risk involved in adding further social objectives to the company law agenda. And that risk is obviously 
that the social welfare objective of company is undermined. In other words, one might be facing here a trade-off, a trade-off between society, the corporate law's core function of promoting the efficiency in the use of resources and the pursuit of these social values. Now, the problem, or at least my problem with uh, trade-off arguments is I find them very difficult to handle. Uh, it's very difficult in particular to put precise numbers on the costs and benefits involved in the trade-off. So what I'm going to try and do in this lecture is tackle this problem without getting stuck in the quagmire of trade-off argumentation by focusing on the last sentence on the slide. Um, because um, uh, I think that on reflection, um, this is not just an empirical matter, it's also a theoretical matter. My argument is going to be that the social welfare argument, which I've just outlined, is uh, plausible or will uh, operate in practice only if three further conditions are present. And uh, I'm going to examine two of them in some detail in a, a little while. Um, and putting these conditions in place can be seen to be not an undermining of the social welfare argument, but uh, as an implementation of it. And further, uh, my argument is going to be that putting these conditions in place will require corporate law to pursue certain social objectives beyond its core social welfare function. Or if you like to put it another way, uh, that implementing the core social welfare function will require corporate law to add certain social objectives to its agenda. Okay. So those are uh, the conditions which are necessary. I've called them assumptions on the slide. I'm not sure that's right. Anyway, uh, my point is that those three conditions need to be in place for the social uh, welfare argument to be achieved. Um, um, the first is that the company operates in a competitive market. If it doesn't, uh, then the management sensitive to shareholder interests can increase the company's revenue simply by raising prices without in any way improving the operational efficiency of the company. Uh, I don't want to say anything more about that except to make the point that the social welfare argument does assume an effective antitrust or pro-competition set of laws. Um, the second proposition, or second condition, is that all the costs of production actually fall on the company. Because if some of them do not, then they will not be reflected in the company's pricing. And from society's point of view, the company's goods or services will be produced too cheaply, and uh, society will consume too much of them. Uh, and this argument, I think, is well established, indeed it's really old hat, in the area of environmental pollution. So if a company production process involves polluting a river, but the costs of cleaning up the pollution or um, uh, preventing it happening fall on other river users or the river authority rather than on the company, then those costs will not be reflected in the company's internal accounting uh, processes. So I'm going to come back to that argument in the uh, third part of the lecture. Um, the third proposition is that, uh, upon which the social welfare argument depends, is that the contracting process for non-shareholder inputs to the company operates in a satisfactory manner. Now, if markets are competitive, this is probably uh, a safe assumption to make in relation to the providers of debt finance raw materials and customers' relations with the 
company. Uh, and if the market is not competitive, then the answer is to make the market competitive, or if it can't be made competitive, as with certain public utilities, then to regulate the company's uh, terms of business. But, as labor lawyers know, matters are not so simple in relation to how the company contracts for labor. Uh, I think tomorrow we'll probably be talking about some of the difficult issues that arise in relation to uh, the initial hiring process. Uh, what I'd like to do in the lecture is focus on uh, problems that arise after hiring in terms of the tricky relationship between the company's internal labor market and the external labor market. So I'm going to assume, but only for the purposes of this discussion, that the initial hiring process operates in a satisfactory manner. Uh, and I'm going to focus on post-hiring uh, contracting problems. Uh, and my argument essentially is that after hiring, uh, the balance of a negotiation, the balance of power, if you like, uh, between workers and the company can shift significantly in favor of the employer for two uh, reasons. First is, as the employee continues in employment, he or she is likely to put down roots in a community, especially family roots, but not just family roots. Um, so that there are non-financial costs of job shift unless the new job can be found in the same geographic area. Second, as the employee continues in employment, he or she acquires firm-specific skills which another employer will not value as highly as the existing employer, and perhaps not even uh, value them at all. And this generates a financial cost of job change because an alternative employer is not likely to be prepared to offer the same wage level as the existing employer because from the new employer's point of view, the employee is in fact less skilled than he or she claims to be. Um, knowing this, knowing of this situation, the existing employer is likely to offer the employee suboptimal wages, i.e. wages that are suboptimal in relation, or wages which do not reflect the level of firm-specific skills which the employee has. And knowing this, the employee is likely to feel constrained to accept the offer. Even worse from society's point of view, the employee may conclude it's not worth investing time and effort in acquiring uh, firm-specific skills. Of course, the boot may be entirely on the other foot if what the employee acquires in the course of employment is generic skills, transferable skills because then the employer may find that he, it has spent uh, time, money, resources in training an employee only to see that employee go off to a competitor, though there are uh, contractual ways in which the employer can protect itself. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, uh, when I was... Um, young, and when Innes was young, uh, the answer to this problem was very simple, and the answer was a collective bargaining. Uh, the uh, atomized uh, employee was replaced by a collective voice, and the collective voice was able to deal with these continuing problems of uh, the employment uh, relationship. Um, and this, therefore, was a, a labor law solution to a contracting problem existing outside uh, corporate law. But in many jurisdictions around the globe, collective bargaining is no longer the force it was. 
uh, nor are effective uh, trade unions. Just as important, at the same time as collective bargaining and trade unionism was in retreat, managers responsive to shareholders became under greater pressure, came under greater pressure, to take advantage of employee vulnerabilities, especially managers in companies subject to international competition in a globalizing economy. As um, uh, Jeff Gordon from Columbia has recently said, managers became, in the globalized economy, less tolerant of slack in the company's operational activities. And um, they would therefore be more likely than they'd previously been to bear down on headcount and to uh, reduce uh, levels of wages. Um, and this led to something which previously had been, I think, unknown, or at least very rare, namely management's deciding to close down plants uh, which were, in fact, profitable. So to give you a couple of examples, there's the carrier plant of United Technologies, which featured fairly heavily in President Trump's uh, presidential campaign. And there was the Tata plant in Florange, uh, which lent its name uh, to the French law of 2014, which was the French legislature's response to uh, that particular uh, an example of that particular uh, management decision. Um, so those are just examples, but um, this slide, I think, shows you, if you like, the high-level uh, consequences of these uh, developments. I don't know how clear that slide is to you, but uh, let me say a bit about it. Along the, um, along the uh, 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 horizontal axis, you've got the position of a worker or a person uh, along uh, in terms of their income across in, the, uh, in a global, uh, 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 around the globe. So this is a global distribution of income um, on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, uh, you've got the gain in real incomes uh, over the period 1998 to 2008. Okay? Now, our interest is essentially in the uh, workers' to the right of point A. Okay, so this part of the grant, the graph, uh, and you can think of these workers as being essentially the workers in the developed countries. Uh, and what you can see is that for workers between uh, the 60th and the 80th percentile, so the lower half of the spectrum of uh, income distribution in developed countries, their gains from uh, over this period were small, in some cases, non-existent. So that's this group, A to B. Uh, for workers, uh, especially those in the top decile of global income distribution, their gains over this period were extremely sub were substantial. Uh, in fact, at, right at the top of the distribution, their gains were better than the gains of the workers at the bottom end of the distribution in uh, global terms. Okay. Now, uh, so what one's seeing, and this is, a, 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 as the slide says, a, a slide produced by the World Bank, uh, probably one of the more uh, famous slides they've produced in uh, recent years. Um, um, what it suggests is that uh, um, there was growing inequality in developed countries because the gains from globalization were captured by a minority of the workers in uh, developed countries, and uh, the majority either gained little or indeed gained uh, nothing at all. Now, I don't want to argue that the shape of this graph is entirely determined by the contracting problems 
I identified earlier. Um, there are obviously other things in there too, but I would want to argue that the contracting problems I've identified made a substantial contribution to the inequality which this graph uh, reflects. Um, and another way of putting it is not just, uh, or a further point to come out of this, is not just growing inequality, but that it's a growing inequality which produced, if you like, uh, an externality, a negative externality, but this time of a global character, or a very general character, sorry, not a global character, a general character. That is to say, it made, uh, it turned uh, the political atmosphere in uh, uh, developed countries against the activities of private sector corporations and made populations less willing to tolerate the processes of uh, globalization. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to see these anti-establishment developments as reflected in, for example, uh, the Brexit vote in the UK, uh, the election of President Trump uh, in the United States, and the growing populist and national, nationalist movements uh, across uh, Europe. Okay, so that's, that's very general stuff. Uh, uh, now the question is, from my point of view, what responses might corporate law make to this? And I think there are really two complementary things that you might uh, uh, want corporate law to do. Um, one is to reduce shareholder pressure on management to take advantage of the vulnerabilities of workers. And the second is to increase the voice of workers in strategic management uh, decision making. Uh, I'd like to say just a word or two about each of those, but um, I don't want to go into enormous detail uh, into what one might change in corporate law in order to reduce uh, uh, shareholder pressure on management. Um, I've listed on the slide the three matters which seem to me to be crucial in giving shareholders this, uh, making management strongly responsive to shareholders, and these are the rules which make it easy for shareholders to remove managers they disapprove of, uh, rules which make it, which facilitate hostile takeover bids, and rules which facilitate the operations of activist hedge funds. So on my agenda, uh, they would be the corporate law rules that one would look at if one was trying to achieve this particular uh, um, uh, objective. Um, um, one other thing one might say is that um, uh, what this shows up is that there's an ambiguity in the initial um, social welfare argument that I uh, outlined, which is um, how much social pressure, how much pressure on managers must uh, shareholders be able to assert, how intense, if you like, must the ultimate control of shareholders over managers be in order to um, uh, yield the efficiency gains of the initial theory. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that some reduction in the intensity of shareholder pressure is necessary in order to prevent that accountability of managers to uh, shareholders resulting in what is in effect a wealth transfer from employees to shareholders, not an increase in the company's operating efficiency. Okay, second set of reforms uh, would be to do things which would um, uh, move employee concerns higher up the managerial agenda. Uh, there are many ways in which this could be done. Some of them would be uh, internal to the corporate structure, such as worker representation on the board. Some would be external, 
uh, such as um, a revivified collective bargaining system, and some would lie somewhere in between, such as uh, works councils with enhanced influence over corporate strategy, uh, or even resetting the investment incentives of the people who invest pension funds on behalf of workers. I doubt if there's a single cross-jurisdictional solution which is best, which is optimal uh, uh, to achieve this increase in uh, employee votes, because uh, I suspect that the optimal situation, uh, the optimal reform, is uh, highly dependent upon particular arrangements in uh, particular uh, jurisdictions. Um, I myself have argued elsewhere that the German system of um, strong works councils plus employee representation on the board within the firm, coupled with multi-employer collective bargaining outside the firm, has enabled German management and German trade unions to produce a much more efficient form of contracting for labor than you find in most uh, British companies. But um, I'm not trying to make a simplistic argument that you can find a set of institutions working well in one jurisdiction and simply move them to another jurisdiction and uh, expect them to work equally well. The only point I want to make at this stage, and it's a very general point, is that experience across jurisdictions and actually experience within jurisdictions over time doesn't suggest that strong, exclusive, ultimate control by, sharehold, by shareholders over companies is necessary to produce the social welfare gains that I started off with. OK, so part three. Um, I'm going to try and uh, talk about environmental harm. Um, so mandatory disclosure by companies of environmental information is now absolutely established in most developed uh, jurisdictions. Um, but there's considerable debate over the rationale for this reporting. Um, essentially, there are two rationales in competition. One rationale, uh, traditionally adopted by the Security Exchange Commission in the US, is that the purpose of disclosure of environmental information is to help investors assess the value of the company. Um, uh, the competing rationale is that uh, disclosure is meant to inform the public generally about the company's environmental footprint. Um, to put it crudely, um, the first sort of reporting, investor-focused reporting, is about the impact of the environment on the company. Uh, the second sort of reporting is about the impact of the company on the environment. Um, um, I'm actually doubtful uh, that investor-focused uh, reporting will actually reveal much new information because it's an awfully long time since a company's annual reports consisted entirely of the backward-looking numbers that you find in the profit and loss account and the balance sheet. Um, Forward-looking reporting, sometimes called narrative reporting, sometimes called financial reporting, uh, sometimes called strategic reporting, is absolutely required of all publicly traded companies across developed uh, jurisdictions. And this ad additional forward-looking non-numeric reporting is based upon the idea, as UK law puts it, that uh, investors need to know about the, quote, principal risks and uncertainties facing the company. Right? So uh, a gasoline distributor would need to report under this general standard 
about the likely impact on its business of a switch to electric cars, whether or not there was any particular investor focus, any specific investor focus reporting requirement in place or not. Moreover, the investor focused rationale doesn't necessarily mean uh, that a company would take steps to reduce uh, its environmental impact. Um, for example, uh, a coal company, coal mining company, uh, might respond to environmental information by lobbying against carbon emission legislation and in the, anticipating that such legislation will eventually come. In the meantime, produce as much coal as possible in an unregulated environment. And indeed, um, uh, the environmental change might be an opportunity for the company. Um, uh, you may not know, probably don't know, uh, that there's now more wine produced in the south of England than, an, than at any time since the, the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, French, quote, uh, sorry, English, quote, uh, sparkling wine uh, now competes very favorably with champagne in blind tastings uh, to the point where French uh, viniculturalists are moving into the operation of UK vineyards. Now, my point is that you can't expect a company engaged in wine production in the south of England to spend resources seeking to reverse the process of climate change, at least short of the point where the south of England uh, becomes a desert. So, uh, and more generally, the point is that in this investor-focused uh, reporting notion, uh, it's the sustainability of the company's business model that's at issue, not the sustainability of uh, uh, human life in uh, uh, an era of global warming. Okay, so the alternative approach seems much more attractive, that the purpose of disclosure um, is indeed to produce information which is probably irrelevant to the um, assessment of the company's value by investors, but which is designed to discourage uh, companies from imposing environmental harm. So the question is, how is it that mere disclosure induces the company to reduce its environmental footprint? Um, well, uh, it might be uh, that uh, the board, which has to sign off on the report, uh, learning for the first time about these harms the company is committing, or at least the extent of them, uh, decides that they should be reduced. More likely, I think, it's that uh, uh, the disclosure will cause the company reputational harm uh, with investors, um, uh, with employees, or, or um, with governments, uh, or with environmental activist groups. Um, but, uh, however, that occurs, what's important to understand is the way in which the disclosure triggers adverse market or political reactions which, and how those adverse reactions feed back into uh, corporate behavior. But the, point, the only point I want to make here about that is that the role that corporate law is playing here in this broader rationale is essentially a minor one. The constraint on uh, uh, corporate behavior is the market or political responses uh, which may be triggered or at least facilitated by corporate disclosure, but it's not corporate law itself which is the main engine for driving uh, the, uh, the desired results. Okay. Um, I've just put that on the uh, slide. That's a slide. That's a letter from Larry Fink. Uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, CEO of Blackstone uh, to the CEOs of the various companies in which Blackstone Invest sent out earlier this year, which uh, gave rise to a lot of discussion. And one reason I think it did generate such a lot of discussion is it's absolutely ambiguous as to which rationale for uh, environmental disclosure it's uh, adopting. And it's also a little bit unclear whether uh, uh, Fink is asserting on behalf of all the people I I whose money Blackstone invests that their priority uh, is to reduce environmental harms rather than any, other, any of the other goals they might have for investing. OK. Um, so, um, 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 beyond disclosure, uh, it's very difficult to find any mandatory rules in corporate law which address the issue of environmental harm. Um, and this is so even if one widens one's uh, focus a bit so as to take in some recent proposals that have been made for expanding the conception of a company's purpose uh, beyond uh, promoting the interests of the shareholders so as to embrace a wider range of objectives which might include um, uh, environmental uh, protection. So, um, but the striking thing about these proposals is that they all, is that they all proceed on a, a voluntary basis. So that's a, a quotation from some bits of a report, a recent report to the French government, uh, which does indeed propose that the company should have the possibility of inserting into its Articles of Association a, uh, 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 a, a raison d'etre which might include environmental uh, considerations. But as you can see from that quotation, this is a voluntary thing. This is removing an obstacle which the authors of the report assume or have established exists in French law for companies which might want to take this step. It's not, a it's not a proposal for a mandatory obligation upon companies. A similar proposal has been made by Oliver Hart recently, uh, the economist at Harvard. Uh, my own uh, colleague and friend at Oxford, Colin Mayer, has made uh, a similar proposal, focusing, however, on the institutional arrangements of corporate governance. Uh, he suggests that companies should be free to uh, introduce alongside the existing executive board what he calls a trust board, which would be the guardian of the company's um, uh, values and purposes. Um, somewhat ironically, uh, <laughs> uh, this proposal is triggered by something he found uh, in the corporate government setup of the Tata group of companies, which I mentioned earlier. Anyway, um, um, now these are all, I think, very interesting proposals, but from the point of view of a corporate lawyer, I think they're pretty uninteresting. Um, at least in the UK, and I think in Canada as well, it's never been the case that the shareholders had to define the purpose of the company in commercial terms. If they want to define the company's purpose, purposes in wholly or mainly in non-commercial terms, then that's fine. And that is the set of objectives within which the management of the company must operate. Uh, and equally, in the UK at least, it's perfectly open to the shareholders to add uh, further refinements to the company's board structure. And if they do so, then that's the board structure within which the uh, uh, directors of the company uh, have to work. So the, the 
point here is that if these initiatives are not mandatory, and if the current law doesn't stand in the way of their implementation, then you might ask the famous question is, well, why don't we see them already? Uh, or put the matter more positively, what would it take to move shareholders towards the adoption of uh, one of these alternatives? Okay, so let me conclude. Um, my overall argument has been that Shareholder-centric corporate law maximizes the incentives for managers to increase the company's overall revenues. From society's point of view, its interest is somewhat narrower than that general proposition. From society's point of view, its interest is in increasing the company's revenues from improvements in the company's operating efficiency and not through wealth transfers from employees, customers, or the general public to shareholders. Wealth, wealth transfers do not imply any increase in operational efficiency of the company simply an increase in the company's uh, revenues. So in order to, that the efficiency arguments that I started off with, in order those objectives should be achieved, one needs to supplement shareholder-centric corporate law with further rules. Now, some of those rules may exist entirely outside corporate law, such as antitrust law, as I've suggested. Um, some may exist entirely within corporate law, such as corporate law's traditional concern with creditor protection arising out of uh, limited liability. Some may exist mainly outside corporate law, but with corporate law playing a bit of a role in the area, a supporting role in the area, as I've suggested is the case with environmental harms. But my main interest, as you may guess, is with uh, employees uh, and employees contracting problems. And what I've suggested is that our traditional solution to this problem, which was indeed entirely outside corporate law in the area of collective bargaining, that the solution for future contracting problems may benefit from uh, the bringing together of corporate law and labor law uh, techniques. Uh, I'm sure that if Innes were alive today, he would be working at this problem. Uh, since he isn't, we must do the best we can without him. Thank you very much.